right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Native Hawaiian Plants webinar, which is hosted by the Landscape Industry Council of Hawaii, also known as LICH and CTAR. I really appreciate you all attending today. My name is Hannah Luchin. I am the Maui County Extension Agent, but I also have statewide responsibilities. I'm here to help the landscaping and ornamental industries. And I just wanted to start off by saying the whole purpose of this seminar series is really to highlight and compliment this uh, wonderful magazine, Hawaii Landscapes, which I will unblur myself and show you at the end during a break. But we just want to really take this time today to, we have three wonderful presenters. So Tamara Cheryl, Matt Keir, and Michelle Au, who are experts in their field. And today they are going to share their wisdom and expertise. And we really get this unique opportunity to meet them and listen to them. Um, a few housekeeping rules before we get started. Please keep your audio microphone on mute throughout the entirety of the presentation. And if you have any questions, please enter it in the chat. We will have a question and answer session at the end of each presenter's talk. Um, also, if you are here for Landscape Industry Certified Technician or LACT CEUs, please be sure to complete the post-webinar survey, which will be emailed after this seminar today. Um, all right, Russell, am I forgetting anything? Well, we should also probably ask people to fill out the demographic reporting also. So maybe we'll add a link for that in the chat. Yeah. Sounds great. Thank you. We'll add a link for demographic reporting. It's voluntary, but it's something the university is trying to compile these days. It's basically demographic information. Uh, if you feel like filling it out, you can. If not, it's voluntary. All right. Thank you, Russell, for that. And without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our first speaker, Ms. Tamara Sherrill. She is the Executive Director of Maui Nui Botanical Gardens, and she will be talking today about uh, native plants. Okay, thanks, Hannah. Would you um, be able to allow me to share my screen? Yeah, sorry. Thank you. So I see some familiar screens and names here. Nice to see all of you. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, I'm gonna be doing a quick presentation on native plants that know how to drink responsibly. Let me see if I can get this to be full. Where's that folks? Oh. Okay, just doing this as a PDF so we don't have any glitches. So this is- There should be, a, there should be in view, there should be a view full screen option. Yeah, I think I've got it, uh, full screen mode. Oh, there we go, thank you so much. Yep. Love it. Okay, so this is just completely based on my own or our, our own personal experience over the last 20 or so years on a five acre site. And, you know, our contact information is here. This is what that site looks like. So we um, have a mission as a, a small public botanical garden in the middle of town on Maui um, to foster appreciation and understanding Maui Nui's plants, by which we mean native plants and Polynesian introduced plants and their role in Hawaiian cultural expression, providing a gathering place for discovery and education and conservation. And as you can see from this photo, we are right in the middle of a low elevation former coastal dune system. And those pathways that you see through the Kiave are um, deer tracks. So we used to be the, the zoo and the only things left are a few of the axis deer, of course, they're all over now. Um, our area has an average annual rainfall of about 18 inches. And this is pretty dry in comparison with like, say the US continent, which is maybe 30 inches annually. It's on the music to dry spectrum compared to all the very widely varied rainfalls across the state. Um, our soil, and I'm giving you all this background just because I am speaking from a specific uh, experience and I'm gonna try and give you generalized Thing, uh, ideas, but just remember this is where we've done our experimenting. 
we've got a sand soil. So this is pure beach sand. Um, that means it's highly alkaline. So the pH um, <clears throat> plants have a hard time accessing phosphorus and most micronutrients. And then we have a lot of large particles. So that means that not only does water evaporate and uh, drain quickly, uh, so it can just dissipate hundreds of gallons of potable irrigation water by accident in minutes, um, but that low surface area on those big particles. So compared to like clay or silt soils, um, nutrients that even nutrients that are available in solution don't stick to those surfaces. They don't have that, the surfaces don't have the charge that they need. And so we've experimented with hundreds of native species and varieties to try and figure out um, what kind of a land, native landscape we can do within these constraints. And just to understand kind of what group of native species evolved to grow well in our area, it just helps to know why certain areas on Maui are dry. And you know, Hawaii's endemic plants, as probably many of you on this call know, evolved in a wide geography with all different kinds of soils, moisture regimes, temperatures, a lot less pressures from pests and diseases. And even for Maui Nui, as you see, you know, this was one contiguous island um, more than a million years ago and then subsided into uh, these smaller islands that are now Maui County, these four separate islands. But, and this is a, from one of my favorite books, the 1998 Atlas of Hawaii, and I literally just took a photograph of it. Um, the amount of rainfall and where rainfall is found on islands is really directly related to the age and geography of an island. And Maui is still considered a pretty young island, even though uh, there's been that much subsidence. So we're the more the top picture. And so you get trade winds coming in over all of this um, wonderful wet ocean gathering, the air is gathering all kinds of moisture. It hits those mountains and it goes up. And when it goes up, it cools down and that can't hold, that air then can't hold as much water. So that's where we're getting our rain. But you can see it actually gets kind of stuck. And that's why we have a dry area at the top. And so we have actually have an alpine zone. Um, so that's called ore orographic rainfall. It is the main source of um, rain and, and fresh water on all Hawaiian islands. We do have some convectional rainfall on the big island, but the drought tolerant superstars are gonna be located in the leeward and um, low to high areas. So there are some areas here on the leeward side where plants have evolved for millions of years and they are they prefer or, or, or can compete and, and do well in really dry areas. So I'm gonna put into the chat, um, this link, because I really love these maps, and this was a while ago, but this is the USGS um, mapping plant species ranges in the Hawaiian Islands. And um, they show plant species ranges as they were historically recorded. So if you see the green parts, that's the historical um, records in herbariums for those species. And you can't read many of these species. These are just some example species. The top one is Pohinahina, which I'm using as a coastal species. And then the possible ranges, um, even though they weren't historically recorded, are the yellow parts. So just remember that these estimated ranges can include developed areas, farmland, you know, really heavily weedy invaded areas. So they're not necessarily where the plants are found today, but they show the potential uh, what we would predict is the potential areas that they would do well. So the reason I'm showing you this is um, some kind of some common ranges for some of the plants that we'll be talking about. So coastal up here um, on the top left is the Pohinihina, Vitex rotundifolia, and then we've got higher elevation species. So you notice that you know it's basically shrunk away from the coasts and more on the uh, mountainsides, and then I've got a real good example here, and that's a cyania, which is in the same family as the one that um, Matt here has in his background. The leeward dry on this bottom left picture is uh, Iliae, and notice how it's all the trade winds are over to the right, um, to the right, and everything's kind of to the left. So these are what I'm going to call the lefties, the leeward dry ones, and compare that to I just grabbed out of the hat. I'm sure there's better ones, but Kautoa which is more of a righty and the trade winds are, you know, that's where the windward wet areas are. 
So this Monono, this Cottawa is mainly found in those wet areas. So these are just examples of um, some of those ranges and species. And I'll be going through some of the plants that do particularly well. And they tend to be, of course, coastal and leeward. Doesn't mean that mountain species, there's, it's pretty much anything leeward is gonna be a great drought tolerant superstar. And I'm only gonna emphasize just a few, go into detail. So the first one I wanna talk about is just if you're a beginner to plants, especially to native plants, because of course native plants are more susceptible to pests and um, all kinds of things because of the way they evolved here in such isolation. Succulents, succulents and pots, super popular right now. And my very favorite one is this one, Portulaca molokiniensis. The reason I love it is you can water this once a month or less and have it in full sun and it loves it. In fact, it will die if you water it any more than that. Um, when you do water it, if you fertilize it, every time you water it, since it's not very often, it'll love that as well. The flowers, now I had in the article that this flowers attracted pollinators. I did a little more reading and I did find that the flowers can self-pollinate. So I'm not sure if that was a completely true statement, but um, this is one of the ones that doesn't do very well in our sandy soil, which of course we may have all kinds of pests and diseases in our sandy soil that didn't used to live there. So it may have once done well in sand. It's also the only portulaca with um, a faint fragrance and it is long lived and those flowers of all these portulacas close in the afternoon. So here's two other, oh wait, here's the range for it. We're gonna do, we're gonna do a little quick look at the ranges and we'll look at the plant. So this is a real Maui Nui species, three, three islands. But if you look, it goes inland and, and onto the isthmus quite a bit. So we're talking a, quite a range of soils here for this particular plant, but extremely, extremely leeward, extremely dry it is not gonna be occurring anywhere where there's a lot of uh, rainfall. So here's, here's another one. There's two other native portulaca, which they're rare in the wild, at least as far as I can tell, um, but they're really easy to grow. This is Lutea, and this one can hybridize with portulaca molokiniensis. They're both polyploids and they, um, they actually can hybridize. It's a little more susceptible to insect pests. Um, its range is said to be more coastal uh, again, I don't have great experience within sandy soil, but it does well in pots, likes full sun. So if we're talking about like a really hot lanai or um, some place that gets just baked, this is a really good candidate for that. And then the last one is this Portulaca velosa. They're all called ihi. This one also reseeds easily, um, but all of these, when they reseed, they can start flowering from in about six to eight weeks. And this one actually doesn't hybridize with Molokiniensis or Lutea. And it can have pink or white flowers. Um, it's a little plant. It's kind, of a, it's kind of a smaller plant, but it will always reseed and regrow. And it's, we've had plants growing for um, decades here at the garden that are still coming true. So this has a wider range, as you can see, and probably should be more widely planted. I don't, I'm, I'm not seeing a lot of people planting this right now. It's quite quite endangered in its native habitat. So there's just little dots um, where this plant lives in reality on these maps. Take a little pause. Have we got any questions yet, Hannah? Yes, we do have one, Tamara. Okay. Um, so the first question is, how do you overcome the higher alkaline soils in areas that you desire to grow plants? I live in an area that has a soil base of compacted and crushed coral. There is about eight inches of topsoil over it. pH is over seven and impacts ability to grow many landscape vegetation. Ooh, call me. Okay, that's a good one. Yeah, we have a similar thing because this, you know, this used to be a dune system here and then a whole bunch of topsoil was brought in. So we've got all kinds of weird water things happening with six inches of weird soil, of clay soil on top of beach sand. Um, I think if you're talking about landscaping with native plants and trying to landscape for drought tolerance, what you wanna do is you're gonna consider some of these plants because these are the ones that I'm talking about do really well in alkaline, sandy, hot, dry areas, which is what Maui Nui Botanical Gardens is. So this is a perfect start. And then, um, and then email me and I'll get you started on some other ones. Um, these range maps are also great. If you're considering a plant, 
you can go to the website. It's a crazy spreadsheet that you look at, but you just find that species and click on it and you can actually see, is it a lefty? Is it something that has leeward, leeward historic ranges? Hope that helps. But yes, this is a good presentation for you for that kind of soil. So here moving, here's a few more succulents, moving into um, just one more succulent, moving into black pepper and ava family. This is Peperomia leptostachia, used to be Blanda. Um, one of these, I don't, I don't know why, but this plant has a really wide range that includes, it's an epiphyte, but it does really well in the driest kinds of pots. So here's an example of our wreath making class. And these are basically little sausages of soil that we put together. And here's one of the peperomia in the foreground. And I swear to God, these are the only plants that survive these wreaths all year. You can forget to water them. And that peperomia, I guess as an epiphyte, is doing fine a year later. This is its range. So it does exist in a lot of the windward areas. Um, it's one of the more common peperomias, but there are, dozens of native Hawaiian peperomia species. So depending on where you are, you might look into something else. This, this, this just happens to be one of the really easy ones to grow. Well-drained substrate, that's the main thing, as long as it's not overwatered. So moving into some ground covers, this is one, you know, we've got a lima, we've got a kia, we've got some fantastic um, pohinahina out there in the, land, the urban landscape, at least here on Maui. I know on Oahu, you guys are a lot more sophisticated and have more stuff, but Ilie'e is still one that's not catching on and I keep talking about it. Now, let me tell you about this picture on the left that's somewhat um, scary. First of all, it Ilie'e was used in Hawaiian cacao or tattooing. And this is, is an experiment that my former boss, Lisa, Raymond, Shattenberg Raymond did when she read that some whalers um, in a whaler's journal that he had seen native Hawaiians doing temporary tattoos with the roots. So if you dig up the roots of this plant and then what she did was she pasted them onto her ankle for 30 minutes with tape and that's what happened. And it lasted for about 60 days and then it faded completely. So it's a chemical burn. And for some reason that exists and it actually still keeps browsing animals off of it. So if you have a lot of deer um, and a lot of browsers, that can be a really good ground cover to plant. It's completely trouble free. You can do it in any soil type. You can prune it into formal shapes. Um, it can be in sun, it can be in shade and it lives forever. This is its range. So it's quite a, a wide range and these little flowers are, are nice, but they're sparse. Don't be fooled by the beautiful pictures. Um, you have to look hard for these flowers. Okay, one more ground cover that I love, and this is an absolute sand lover. This is just beach morning glory, just po hui hui. But I just want to tell you, we've got an area that's about, I don't know, 200 feet by 200 feet. We planted one plant and it has been, it has covered it completely. So it's really easy to grow. It doesn't get any water there. Um, really common on sandy beaches and leeward coasts. And it doesn't twine or climb. So it looks like a viner, but it's not a climb, climbing plant. And what's great is it's a host plant for this native, this endemic kanaoa, which is Cascada sandwich, sandwich, Sandwichiana, which is the lay flower of Koho Olave. So we'll talk about both of those. Here's one of the lays that we've made, one of the lay that we've made. So this is the Beach Morning Glory Pohui Hui's range. I have that in manual flowering plants, it was once found up to more than a thousand feet elevation. And I haven't seen that tested, but I suspect that this species really prefers sandy soils. And I think you could get it going in other areas as well. Kanaoa has a wider range and it doesn't only attach to Pohui Hui. So you might see it on Ilima, Nopaka, Nohu, um, I don't know if any, is there anyone here who's had experience trying to attach it to non-native species? Nope, clean shaking heads. Okay, I wanted to, wanted to pick you guys brain about that. Um, there's a paler non-native version of it that's almost identical, which is um, Cascada campestris. And then there's an indigenous thicker vine, thicker stemmed uh, version of this that's Kano or Pehu or Cassithia. Filiformis. So just make sure if you're going to get it started that you got the right one. 
All right, and then just a few shrubs and trees I wanted to emphasize. Nio is a really common one that people know. Um, it's long lived. It's really valued for the wood, which was used for holly construction and really valued for firewood. It can be sensitive to drought at juvenile stages, but what I've noticed about Nio is it can lose all of its leaves and the stems still stay alive. So this is a real survivor in severe droughts. Um, we have this, these taller varieties uh, that are mature and these can get quite huge if they're at higher elevations. And then the dwarf habit to the right, which is um, a big island form that's from the coast, I believe it's from the south side, uh, which does max out at about at several feet if you let it. If it's not in a super windy area, it can get quite tall. And this is the range of Nio. So look at that range. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. So they, they say it can go all the way up to about 7,000 feet. Um, and these, you know, some of these woody native plants that are leeward maybe might not keep their foliage in serious drought. But if, if you're talking about even if the stems are dying back and it's coming back from the ground, that's a, a good plant to have um, in, a, in a hot and dry area. All right. And then Here's an endangered species that's actually really drought tolerant and very easy to grow. Um, it's endemic. It's in the hibiscus family, as you can see. Um, once common in a lot of the sugarcane areas, so a lot of the mid mid range areas and the low areas. People know it as red alima. It makes a beautiful lay. Just remember that you do have to have a red tag if you're going to be getting this species. And it has little minute hairs like elema and a lot of other native plants that help it retain water. And if water gets restricted, the leaves tend to get a lot smaller. This is the range for Colo, Ula, Butylon, Menzisii. And um, again, a lefty, very much a leeward plant. And I've seen it survive some serious irrigation breaks here. Taller trees, if you're looking for shade kinds of trees, you can't, I mean, you have to say, you have to mention Willy Willy. This is a keystone species, of course. And a lot of you probably were part of the whole Erythrina gall wasp thing that was happening in the two, early 2000s. Um, it is a summer deciduous tree, just like a polyceus species, um, but really drought tolerant, even at juvenile stages. So they'll lose their leaves in the summer, have that gorgeous bloom on the bare branches, and then have, leave, have the leaves come back out again. And of course, beautiful for lay as well. Different colors of the flowers, beautiful seeds for lay, and quite a wide range. I mean, this is kind of surprising to people who only see it here on Maui driving by, you know, small areas in Kihei. You know, Willy Willy was a big part of the leeward forests. And there's lots and lots of places uh, high in higher elevations where we could be planting it. So speaking of higher elevations, since I've stayed down low, I'm only going to mention Mamani just because that is going to be my only token high elevation, super drought tolerant plant. Um, this is, of course, a super important food source for a lot of native birds, but especially for the Palila, which is on the big island. But the wood was also used for halua sledding and all, all other kinds of uses. Um, it's evidently a really hard wood. Um, Michelle Smith of Maui Native Nursery told me that when she forgets or when she has an irrigation break or forgets to water the seedlings, even the seedlings don't wilt. And that's the very few species you can say that about. And this is the range for Mamane. Again, a lefty, so leeward sides but higher elevations all the way up to the top of Haleakala, of course, and pretty high up on the big island as well. So that is what I, uh, oh, there was one thing, one more thing I wanted to say about this. When we were talking about native birds, um, you know, in areas like, like the big island where the elevational range of, of Mamani and also, also Maui um, has been reduced because of agriculture and development and that kind of thing, birds really need all those different elevations to have flowering plants. If they depend on the seed pods and the insects and the seeds and the buds of these plants to live, they need to have flowering plants at different times of the year. And of course, that's what happens up the elevation. You start, you know, start lower and then later on the higher elevation ones. So planting species like this, that maybe even just some small native insect uh, depends on, 
can really help out, even if you're just doing a few plants in your yard, you never know what kind of effect you might have on extending the range of that plant. Okay, that's all I have to say and um, appreciate your time and let me know if you have any questions. You can email me at, um, I'll put my email in the chat. Thank you so much, Tamara. Um, we do have a few questions before we move on to Matt here. Sure. So the first one is, um, I work in Olinda at Rainbow Acres Cactus Nursery and I feel like we find Portulaca villosa in our pots and growing on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, I've also seen it on bunny ears and Wayanapa Napa. Is this probable? Bunny ears? What does that mean? You know the cliff jumping place at Wayanapa Napa Park? Oh, okay. Yes, that is possible. I don't know if that's, if it's there. The only place I ever saw it was out at, um, at a Hihi Canal, but I don't get out. I'm, I'm right here all the time. So, um, oh, thank you. Large rock. Got it. Found some. Yeah, no, it's likely it is. There is a portulaca that has the little rice shaped uh, leaf as well, but it's got a bright pink flower and that's different. That's a different one, but this is, um, if you're seeing it reseeding in your nursery, yeah, that's exactly what it does here too. It's a big reseeder and, and grower. Yours has a very purple flower. Okay, yeah, that, I think that is the one, is that Pilosa? Matt, help me out. Yeah, Pilosa. That is called, um, that's a, that's a non-native one. But send me a picture, we can see. Great, thank you, Tamara. Sure. Another question is, is there a, frag is there a fragrance um, on a portulaca, maybe the portulaca ludia, or did I possibly mishear the fragrance? So fragrance is interesting because you're thinking like, okay, what's the pollinator? The only, I was just reading, um, uh, I was just reading an article and I've noticed a fragrance on portulaca molokiniensis. It's faint and it's only, you know, the flowers only open in the, in the morning and then they tend to close in the afternoon. They're only open for about four to six hours. And so they close up and then the fragrance is gone. But this paper said that they were looking at pollinators of Portulaca and that Molokiniensis was the only one that had that. Everything else was pretty scentless. So gotta go try, gotta go sniff a few and find out. <laughs> I like that, smell the flowers. Mm -hmm. uh, another question is, what is a common pest for Ko'oloa ula? Oh yeah. Yeah. Could Chinese rose beetle be eating this? Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, rose beetle is a is really common pest for anything in the hibiscus family, anything Malvaceae. Um, and yes, you won't see the beetle because they come out at night and they're they're feeding at night. Um, people put lights on them. Sometimes that helps keep them off. Neem, I don't know. Anybody else want to type in some ideas for rose beetle in the chat? I'm sure JB Friday and some other people here have some great ideas for that. But yeah, hibiscus family can get a lot of pests. And you just have to keep them really well fertilized and make sure that they're, you know, are weeded and cared for because that's that's the best defense against pests is just make sure you care for them well. Um, great. One um, last question, if you could briefly touch on this, and I'm sure Matt, Matthew Keir will also touch on it, is what does the red tag mean in regarding uh, endangered plants? Yes, yeah, so I, I am going to let Matt Keir answer that, actually. It's a, that's an important question. Um, but what I'm telling you about the red tag is if you have an endangered species and you're, by, you're purchasing it, and you know that it's endangered, and of course you can search that online easily. Um, it should always have that tag because that means that the grower is permitted to give it to you or sell it to you. Great, thank you, Tamara. All right, and that's actually a great segue to uh, Mr. Matthew Keir, who is the botanist for State of Hawaii Division of Forestry and Wildlife. And he wrote an excellent article about Hawaii's plant extinction prevention program. Um, so without further ado, Matthew.
All right, can you see my screen? Yes, looks great. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, that's right, I'm a botanist with uh, DLNR, Division of Forestry and Wildlife. And I put together some slides uh, about native plants and conservation in Hawaii. So a couple of standard background things to know that Hawaii is very isolated and far away from any, anywhere and anybody else. And that's been great in the last couple of years, especially. But it's also really shaped the plants that we're able to get here and why our native plants are so different than anywhere else. Hawaii has almost all of the world's climate zones. So except for tundra and ice cap, uh, every other climate zone can be found uh, in Hawaii. So these are stretched across landscapes uh, that are all familiar to, to us and close to a beach and can be very rugged. We have uh, coastal and dune habitats, and these are still intact in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, but have been degraded uh, throughout most of the rest of the state. But there still are some re really important lowland, coastal, and dry forest shrubland areas. We still have uh, thick, uh, wet rainforests across uh, most of the Hawaiian islands, there are intact native ecosystems in wet forest on every island. Uh, upper elevation areas have uh, bogs and high elevation shrublands that harbor uh, unique native plant communities. So the older islands have been weathered over millions of years and form a twisting terrain with numerous microclimates. And the new island is continuously reforming itself and transferring back uh, from, from forest to rock and back to forest again. So you see these evolutionary processes repeating themselves uh, still today. So over the course of uh, millennia, there have been, there have been uh, numerous uh, plant colonizations. So these are plants that arrive by wind, water, or attached to birds or somehow in a bird. And then once they got here, they were successfully established. And many of them expanded to uh, radiate into many new species and we're still finding a new species today. But because they evolved here, and because many of them are not found anywhere else in the world, these are endemic to Hawaii. So about 90% of the flowering plants or angiosperms are endemic. And uh, this number is actually should be 74% of the pteridophytes. So those are ferns and other related uh, fern-like plants are only found in Hawaii. One famous example is our Hawaii state flower, Hibiscus brackenridgii, or Ma'ohao hele. And another one that's well known and rare these days is Ohai, or Sesbania tomentosa. And Hawaii is lucky to have some famous rare plants uh, like the silver sword where people travel thousands of miles to see these plants and think of them as a highlight of their trip. And these plants from the sea cliffs of Molokai and Kauai, the Aulula, have been taken into the commercial nursery uh, industry in Europe and tens of thousands of these plants have been grown and distributed uh, as an indoor plant in Europe. Hawaii also famously has many extinct plants. There are over 100 kinds of native plants that we cannot find anywhere today and they are completely lost. 
and Hawaii has way more endangered and threatened plants than any other state. There are over 450 kinds of native plants only found in Hawaii on the U.S. endangered species list, far more than any other state. And so this is what I work on. I work on rare plant conservation for the Division of Forestry and Wildlife. And together with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, we uh, coordinate to run the plant extinction prevention program. And one of the things we try to do is make sure we know how many native plants are in Hawaii. And there are some new ones being described almost every year. So right now we have about 1,380 native plants. There are 108 of these that we cannot find anywhere and we don't have any growing and cultivation and these are extinct. Like I said, there are 454 different native plants from Hawaii on the U.S. threatened and endangered species list. And the PET program focuses its efforts on the especially rare plants. So there are 204 different species, different kinds of plants that have less than 50 individual plants remaining in the wild. That's their entire population. And there are over 100 kinds of native plants that have fewer than 10 individual wild plants remaining in the wild. And many of those 100 have zero. There are no wild plants remaining, but we have them in cultivation. So the reasons for this decline and the endangerment are numerous, such as development and vast landscapes transformed by uh, different land uses and agriculture. And one that's becoming uh, more extreme today, wildfire. And these large changes, uh, you know, stripped habitats off the landscape and impeded uh, native plant ecosystems uh, for, for hundreds of years. Today, we see the impacts of numerous uh, introduced uh, invasive species, uh, such as feral ungulates that make their way across the landscape. And in order to protect plants from them, they all need to be physically excluded. We have uh, hundreds of species of weeds that have been brought in or accidentally introduced to Hawaii. And these now have to be manually controlled and removed from the forests that they've become established in. Rats uh, consume the fruit and entire plants of native species that are not adapted to be able to withstand this kinds of browsing. And these threats must be individually controlled uh, by field crews who repeatedly have to set up grids and keep the onslaught of rodents away from our native plants. We also have introduced slugs and snails that quickly devour young seedlings. And some rare species are exceptionally vulnerable to this uh, depredation by slugs. Wildfire, as I mentioned, uh, is, is destructive. There are certainly a few plants, several plants maybe, a better word, that can withstand fire and come back after fire or their seed banks are released after fire, but many of the plants are not. They did not evolve uh, with anthropogenic fire in the landscape. And on the older islands, uh, it's been quite some time since we've seen an eruption. So the plants are, are not uh, equipped to be able to come back. So habitats and landscapes need to be uh, replanted uh, from scratch, plant by plant. And of course, we've, we've experienced a loss of all kinds of biodiversity in Hawaii, invertebrates and vertebrates alike. And the loss of those organisms has triggered other declines in native plants that depended on them for pollination services or seed dispersal. But today, the effects of those loss are uh, mitigated by staff who can hand pollinate individual flowers 
uh, when the pollinators are, are not abundant enough to get the job done themselves. So this is where we come in with direct intervention in these types of ways. The Plant Extinction and Prevention Program has right now 13 and a half a part-time and not a half person staff botanists. And we target 257 uh, taxa. So some of them are subspecies and varieties uh, that have a few remaining plants in the wild. And of the 120 taxa with less than 10 plants left, uh, only 17 of them are not in cultivation yet. And of the 25 plants that we've lost in the wild in the last 20 years, uh, 20 of them are in cultivation, which means they're not extinct. They're extinct in the wild, but they're maintained in nurseries and seed plant banks and being planted out into the wild. And this is how extinction is prevented. Uh, we have a website. It's P-E-P-P-H-I dot org. I'll put it in the chat afterwards. So I wanted to show off some of the plants uh, that we work with on each of the islands. Um, you know, I, I'm really very, very lucky to be able to work with so many great people and so many great places. And one of the things I realized, you know, is that hardly anybody gets to see images of these rare plants. So let's take a look. This is on the island of Kauai. This is the uh, Adenophorus parians that was uh, recently rediscovered on the island of Kauai. So you're seeing pictures of the actual plants that were rediscovered. And right now we're working uh, to secure these uh, in cultivation and try to understand how to grow them. One of the things about rediscovering a rare plant is that you don't know exactly what to do with it right away. So a lot of this is experimentation. And hibiscus clayi. From, uh, on Oahu, uh, we have a bird pollinated mints like this uh, stenogeny that was only found in the Waianae Mountains and is now extinct in the wild. And fantastic uh, plants on the summit of the Koala Mountains like this endemic species of Lobelia. This is a bird pollinated thistle, uh, Hesperomania, which is exceedingly rare. This is the species that's endemic to the Waianae Mountains. And of course, palm trees. And there are uh, five species of Lo'ulu on Oahu. So we really have fantastic native ferns and fern allies. This is a really beautiful plant, uh, Hubersia manii, from the island of Maui. This species of cyania was uh, recently discovered. A single lone individual plant was discovered on West Maui by pet botanists and described as cyania heloensis. And this is a really beautiful uh, low elevation coastal vine from uh, North Maui. And Another example of spectacular cyanea plants. On Koho'olawe, we have maybe one of the best plants of them all, the Kanaloa Koho'olawensis. This is also extinct in the wild, but maintained in cultivation uh, by Tamara for many, many years. And we have her to, to thank uh, amongst others for, for still having these plants around today. Tosferum halophyllum from the island and offshore islets of Molokai. One of our native gardenias, this is a wet forest gardenia from Molokai. This one also occurs on other islands. 
in the famous uh, Brigamia uh, from the sea coast of Molokai. So we think there are now fewer than 10 plants of these remaining in the wild. And the species from Kauai, the insignis, is uh, now extinct in the wild. And more uh, Lolu. Lanai also has beautiful plants. We have remnant populations of this find of a viki viki. Uh, they have a hidden petal, a butylon, that's related to the one that Tamara was talking about earlier, and their own uh, endemic cyanea species. This is uh, a dryland aster. And on Hawaii Island, another set of beautiful cyanea. And the uh, ha'evale plants. This is one of the most endangered, this is the most endangered genus, uh, Shidia, in Hawaii. More, I think it's like 20 of the 24 species are listed as endangered. Another example of, uh, of the mints. This is probably, this is my favorite native tree. The Mehamehame, it was found all across the state and is now uh, incredibly endangered uh, and the target for restoration. They're dioecious, so they have male flowers on one tree and female flowers on another. And unfortunately, they aren't close enough together. So we do spend a lot of time uh, getting air layers and rooted cuttings of these trees, bringing them into cultivation and, and breeding uh, these beautiful fruit we can use for restoration. This is a, a plant that I was lucky enough to work with for a long time. And just wanted to show you some examples of the timeline. For a long time, it was thought to be extinct until it was rediscovered by uh, Steve Perlman and John Obata in the Waianae Mountains in the early 1970s. It took a while because the last uh, places were on a military training range. And, but a fence was constructed in 1995. We did numerous seed collections in 1997 until it went extinct in the wild in 2002. But these plants, there are hundreds of them now being planted all over the Waianae Mountains and it's the target for ongoing restoration. And at first we saw there were no fruits, right? The rats would eat all the fruits. And this is typical of what you would try to do when you get up to a plant. It's got problems because it's got no babies. And once these plants pass along and there's no keiki, uh, you get extinction. So the first thing to do is figure out why there aren't any fruit. And that was the answer. When you do get fruit, they come out in these beautiful uh, fruits that, that look like there should be a bird that eats them. If the birds aren't there and the fruits drop to the forest floor where they're quickly eaten by slugs. And there is some options for slug control and you can get seedlings uh, back um, in, in some cases back into a wild environment. And this usually takes 10 years and a lot of figuring out each one of these steps and lots of research and lots of people. And in the end, when we see that the fruits aren't being dispersed, we see a rapid decline in seed viability so that within two weeks, the, the viability of these seeds is all gone. So unless the fruits are being dispersed by the birds, uh, they're not likely to germinate in the soil. And this is the level of complications that we're trying to address. But these plants are out there today and we're still working on how to keep them moving forward. All of this work has taught us a lot about native seeds. These are some examples of beautiful native seeds from the Lion Arboretum. And we have some fantastic people that are growing plants on every island. These are pictures from the volcano nursery uh, uh, on, the, on Hawaii Island, uh, Oahu nursery up above Mokulaia, a Maui nursery up above Mokawao, and we have two nurseries on Kauai uh, at, at Koke'e is the mid-elevation one. 
this chart shows how effective we're trying to be. And this is a chart showing the number of the plant extinctions uh, by 20 years, going back to 1826. And you see there's a lot of red, and these are the 108 species that we've lost. And we lost all of them early on. But starting in the 1910s, people started to realize what was going on, and we saved one in cultivation. And you can see this blue bar is growing and growing and growing as we're getting better and better at preventing extinctions. And we hope to turn it all blue uh, next decade. More and more, we see that this, besides uh, rare species conservation, there's also a need for a lot of reforestation. So I wanted to show a couple of things we, we know about rare plant uh, I'm sorry, native plant uh, growing in Hawaii. So maybe some of you have seen this chart before from a survey we did to try to figure out what is the native plant material supply and demand in Hawaii. So we know something about how many programs there are and how many plants they plant a year. Most of these programs are uh, collecting their own plants and growing their own plants and putting them into natural areas. So a lot of this is a state of Hawaii, national park, watershed partnerships, and small uh, community-based restoration. This is an example of how we can integrate um, science with restoration and community restoration. A lot of people are using seed sowing where they're collecting a lot of seeds from their site and they're putting them out and expecting to get germination. And we do see um, you know, more than a third of the groups are doing something with that. We know which species they're using, but we can also tell them what the seed dormancy is for this. Because of many years of research, we understand uh, which can be expected to germinate right away, which need a physical cut or scrape to become imbibed and germinate, and which others have some undetermined dormancy. So if you go back to your site and you don't see any seedlings, you should keep going back for seven to 17 years and, and they might eventually show up. So understanding this type of uh, physiology is important to, to knowing what's gonna germinate. We know something about which species are used and it's about a 10th of our flora. So we're not using enough species in our, in our restoration programs. And this is something the, the horticulture industry and, and research can help out with. We found uh, similar things as the Australians did in their survey is that the market is not willing to pay the true cost for collecting seed. Seed orders are made last minute. And right when the fire happens, can I please have 100,000 Aali plants doesn't work very well. And the future demand from our wild plants uh, is going to be difficult to meet um, with, the, with the dwindling number of wild plants. So we can't collect more and more seeds from fewer and fewer plants and expect to have a good result. So we've identified a whole bunch of limiting factors in this supply chain. In collecting from wild plants, in processing and storing the seed, in producing enough to meet our demands, and in getting the plants to the highest uh, success when they're installed at the site. There are a lot of people that do this work. This is a UH Hero graph showing that there are about 5,000 people that work in the natural resource management sector. We think about 10% of them are working on rare plant conservation or plant conservation of some type. And this is going on statewide. And all these jobs are available. And uh, we're, we're always looking to recruit people who love plants and, and doing this kind of work. There's tons of places that you can uh, work and get experience on each island. 
Okay, and I wanted to round out with my favorite topic is permits. So permits are needed to work on endangered species, and that's part of what I administer at DOFA. The first step is to determine what species you need to work with, and I'm happy to pass along these uh, resources of where you can get a list of endangered species and where you can identify who owns what land. If you need a permit to collect on state land, uh, you got to figure those kinds of things out. And I'm happy to pass along these resources uh, through you, Hannah. And another thing we work on is, um, is these commercial use tags. So these are the red tags that, that uh, Tamara showed a picture of. And so over the years from 1998 until recently, I ran this yesterday, we've uh, issued one well, plus 20, I gave out this morning, 123,849 red tags have been issued for 70 different endangered species. Just in the last year, we were really happy to see a big uptick. It mostly came from a couple of big vendors, but we sold uh, over 13,000 uh, tags uh, in the last year, but since January. So you can see how it kind of goes up and down. These are the plants that are requested. These are what we sell the tags for, and you're only supposed to use these tags on the plants you say you're gonna use them. So the big four are Gardenia bricamii, so dry land nau, Bricamia and Cygnus, the Olula from the cliffs of Kauai, the Sesbania tomentoso, which is a statewide uh, rare plant, Ohai, and Mauhau hele, the hibiscus brachymergii. That's all I got. So really appreciate being here and talking rare plants with you all, and uh, thanks. Thank you so much, Matt. Really appreciate your presentation. I know I learned a lot. Uh, we do have a few questions, several thank yous. I was just curious if you had any um, recommendations. If I'm a landowner, what type of fence would you recommend? Like in Maui County with deer, do you suggest an eight foot perimeter fence? Or if I'm in Oahu or the Big Island with pigs, would you recommend a six foot fence with a collar skirt at the bottom for pig control? Yeah, really good questions. And yes, for deer, you need at least an eight foot fence. I know sometimes you can get away with putting a four or five foot fence and then uh, adding some wires along the top. So sometimes you don't have to get a full eight footer uh, but your posts need to be at least eight, uh, nine or 10 feet in order to get a fence like that. Uh, and then certainly if you have pigs, what they're gonna try to do is dig under your fence. So if you, you we call it a skirt, you build a fence like this and a fence like that that lies along the ground. And then when the pigs try to dig under to get under the fence, they can't get through that. So often you'll see the fences lying on the ground and then they're tacked into the ground. Um, so if you're getting real extreme pressure, that's what I would recommend doing. Great, thank you so much. Um, does anyone else have a question, comment, concern? I just want people are pointing out, like I think I see this portulaca on the bunny ears and that kind of stuff and feel free to email me your pictures of plants, I love looking at them. And that's how we can uh, get, you know, everybody else more involved in, in knowing plants. It's, it's likely that what you're seeing of that portulaca is, uh, is portulaca pilosa. So it not only looks like the one she was showing, but it sounds like it too. Thank you, Matt. We appreciate that. Um, we have another question. What can homeowners do to help? That's a great question. So we're limited by funding. We work really hard to get government support and the state of Hawaii gives us everything that we can, but you can donate to the Plant Extinction Prevention Program. I'll drop that link in the chat as soon as we're, I'm POW. Um, and as a homeowner, the most important thing you can do is to not plant more weeds probably. So there's the Plant Pono website and I would encourage people to 
uh, make sure that what species they're using in their landscaping are not going to cause problems for the next homeowner and your neighbor. So not selecting plants that will become naturalized in native areas. Great, thank you so much, Matt. Really appreciate your time today and your expertise. And uh, yes, we, it would be great if you could put your contact information in the chat, please. And um, now it is four o'clock, so I would love to introduce our last speaker, Miss Michelle Au. He is a graduate research assistant in insect ecology and integrated pest management laboratory in the Department of Plant and Environmental Protection Services, also known as PEPS, at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And today, Michelle, we're lucky to hear from her and her expertise on the Rami moth. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, can everyone see that? Good, okay, perfect. So aloha, thank you so much for having me today. My name is Michelle. I am a graduate student in the Plant Environmental Protection Sciences Department at UH Manoa. And today I'm be talking about a mamaki and a new pest that is attacking it. As a little bit of background, mamaki or Pipteris albidus um, is a native Hawaiian plant found nowhere else on earth. It is endemic to Hawaii. It is a needleless and stingless member of the nettle family, Urticaceae. It has dark green leaves um, and red veins. Um, and there's several different varieties of uh, mamaki. Um, it has cultural, biological, and agricultural purposes. Um, in Hawaii, culturally, mamaki has been used um, as a source to make kapa cloth. Um, it can also be used for medicinal and ceremonial uh, purposes in tra uh, traditional la'au lapa'au practices. Um, biologically, um, there are several endemic insects, um, such as the kamehameha butterfly uh, that do rely on mamaki as a food source. Um, and this in turn also supports our native bird populations that may be feeding on these insects. Um, mamaki is also becoming agriculturally important as a specialty tea crop. Um, there are companies like Shaka Tea that are producing mamaki teas and selling them worldwide. And so mamaki is currently being attacked um, by a new pest called the rami moth, um, Arcticarula. It is a moth in the Noctuid family. So it is native to Southeast Asia, um, but has since spread um, up to Northern Asia, like Japan, um, as well as in, into parts of Oceania. So in its native range, uh, the rami moth feeds on a range of host plants um, in the nettle family, uh, primarily the rami plant, hence its common name. Um, and this includes several species of vomeria um, and all of these uh, plants are used as a natural fiber crop um, in its native range, uh, similar to how we use mamaki here in Hawaii. Um, so DLNR first uh, discovered uh, the rami moth caterpillar defoliating mamaki um, in Olovalu in the West Maui Mountains in 2018. Oh. And a week later, um, they actually found the caterpillar in Olinda at the Olinda Rare Plant Facility in um, East Maui. Um, and so from this, um, we know that the moth can travel quite far distances and is spread into different parts of Maui. Um, so this is the first record of the rami moth um, in the United States. It's currently not found anywhere in the continental U.S. Um, so the rami moth does pose a big threat to our um, native uh, wild and cultivated populations of mamaki. Um, it can also impact our endemic kamehameha butterfly populations by competing for the same resources. And I really like to show this picture. Um, it was taken in um, Olovalu in, um, when they first detected the uh, rami moth caterpillar. So in this bottom right, you can see there's three rami caterpillars in red um, that are feeding on this heavily defoliated branch of mamaki. Um, and you can also see a kamehameha butterfly up here. And so we know that they are competing for the same resources. Um, I wanted to do a brief uh, description of uh, the different life stages of the rami moth. Um, just show you some pictures um, to, so you know what to look out for. Um, and then just a brief um, life cycle of it. So the eggs are clear and white in color. They're circular in shape, about a millimeter in diameter, and they're laid singly on the underside of um, the leaves. So there's usually one 
egg per leaf, but sometimes we find two or three eggs per leaf. Um, the larvae are green in color. Um, they have these black specklings. Um, when they're first hatched, they'll have this tannish um, head capsule color, um, but as they develop, um, it'll turn into this darker black. Um, and then in later instars, they become more conspicuous. You'll see these bright orange red spots on the side of their bodies, and they have these long, um, thin white hairs um, that are protruding from their um, body. Um, and then when the larvae is ready to pupate, it will actually crawl down um, onto the bottom of, into the base of the plant. Um, it'll either tie together leaf debris um, or it'll actually bury into uh, the soil to create its pupal chamber. It takes about 15 to 20 days um, for the adult to emerge out. So the adult moths are um, this brownish gray coloration. Um, it does have speckles of silvery blue um, on its forewing with the scalloped wing edge. Um, its hind wings um, has this um, bright silvery bluish marking, um, hence the name Arctic Karula. Karula means blue. Um, and so one thing to note with the rami moth um, that's different from other caterpillars that may be feeding on mamaki is its um, distinctive aggressive behavior. So especially when you get to these late um, instars, um, when you disturb the caterpillar, it kind of rears up its legs and it will shake violently um, and regurgitate this green liquid as a form of defense. And we do not see that in any of the other caterpillars that do feed on mamaki. So there are three potential larval lookalikes um, that feed on nettles, primarily mamaki. Um, of course, we have our state insect, our kamehameha butterfly, Vanessa tamehameha. Um, we do have an endemic crambid moth called Eudea stellata. Um, and then we also have the red admiral, Vanessa atalanta. This is not native to Hawaii. Um, it's primarily found on um, Hawaii Island. So in the field, um, the easiest caterpillar to mistake for the rami moth um, is our endemic um, crambid Eudea stellata, and that is because the caterpillars also are green and white in coloration. Um, the easiest way to distinguish between the two is that the rami, um, it moves in like an inching like motion, like an inchworm, um, and that allows it to move quickly. Um, and that is because um, if you can see their back legs or their pro legs are more towards the end of their body, um, allowing them to do that inching motion. Eudea, on the other hand, do the typical crawling, wiggling motion like you think of when you think of a caterpillar. Um, and that is because its pro legs are more evenly spaced throughout its body. Um, another important thing to note is that um, the rami moth does get quite um, significantly larger than um, Eudea. Eudea is quite a small um, moth. And so this picture up top of the rami moth are actually first in the stars. Um, they recently emerged from the eggs. While Eudea, um, these two images that I have are of later in the star, probably fifth or sixth um, in star. And so when you see a really like tiny uh, green caterpillar, it most likely will be Eudea. The rami um, develops quite quickly after it has emerged from its egg. Um, another thing to look for is um, this uh, black spots that you see on the side of its body. Um, Eudea will not have that. They instead have these four black dots on the top of their head. Eudea also like to create this web structure, if you can see um, right here, um, and that is um, a form of protection. So when you see a caterpillar crawling out and about, if you kind of disturb it, um, Eudea will most likely start to retreat back um, into this webbing structure while the Rami will just run away and that's its form of defense. Um, and then we have our two butterflies. Um, the Kamehameha and the Red Admiral um, will look similar to the Rami moth um, at early instars. And that is because they all share this black head capsule um, and they also have the hairs that protrude from its body. Um, in early stages, um, both butterflies uh, can have variation in their body uh, color. And so it can be mistaken for the Rami moth. However, um, by later instars, they'll look very different. Um, the um, two nymphalids have uh, different color morphs due to uh, uh, temperature and sunlight. So you'll get this typical green, uh, brightly colored kamehameha butterfly um, when it's sunnier and warmer. This is more common um, around all of the islands. Um, the darker brown morph is when it's in cooler conditions, primarily found on Hawaii Island. Um, and then the red admiral is primarily found on the big island as well. Um, for the rami moth, um, we get color morphs due to a uh, crowding or aggregation. So oftentimes we'll see like three or four caterpillars on a single leaf or single plant. 
um, and that um, aggregation causes the blacking on um, the black bands on its body to widen conspicuously, creating this black morph. Um, when they're solitary, they'll definitely be more yellow. Um, so if you don't see caterpillars on your mamaki plants um, and you want to look at feeding damage, um, you can look at uh, the protective structures that these caterpillars create. The kamehameha butterfly will um, kind of eat out um, the corner of a leaf edge um, and then fold it over to create a tent-like structure for protection. And then it will feed uh, within the tent. Um, and then once it's done eating, it'll come out and create another tent and it'll continue to do this um, eating from the outside of the leaf inward until it um, becomes a later instar and then it'll just kind of feed around. Uh, Yudea, on the other hand, like I mentioned, creates this webbing-like structure. Um, so you can see all of this white um, web webbing that it produces. These are all little homes that it has created. And then you'll usually see brown speckling and that is feeding damage because the caterpillar likes to crawl out, feed, and then go back in. Um, and then it causes the leaf to brown. Uh, Rami, on the other hand, does not make any protective structure. It will kind of just walk all over the leaf, feed in one area, then feed in another area. Sometimes it'll move from leaf to leaf as it feeds. Um, and so with Rami damage, we usually see different um, small spots of feeding damage. And then over time, it'll become really big um, to the point where you're just left with the leaf veins. And then one of our concerns is that the rami moth is also feeding on other nettles in Hawaii that we may not be aware of. So things like um, Ahulea is also Bomeria, oops, sorry about that, is also a um, Bomeria species. Um, I know that there's um, a lot of outplanting of opuhe in our native forests. Um, so making sure that the rami is not feeding all the keikis that are planted out. Um, and other um, natives like Olona and Ma'oloa, I know they're present in our nurseries, um, in our forests. Um, so just keeping an eye out if you work on any of these plants to make sure that Rami is not uh, feeding on any of them. Um, and then I also included Cercopia, um, which is not native, it's the trumpet tree, but it's found everywhere. It is a nettle. Um, and to just, if you're out and about, just uh, to keep an eye out to see if there's any caterpillars on them, any feeding damage, um, that's all great information um, for us to know. And so from our um, surveys, as well as um, public reports, we've kind of been able to map where we've seen the Rami moth so far. Um, it's kind of spread throughout Maui, um, but on Hawaii Island, it's primarily in the Puna area. This is uh, where many of, sorry about that. Um, this is where many of our uh, Mamaki farms are at. Um, so we're definitely serving heavy, heavily here, um, but we're also checking places like Waimea to make sure that it's not spreading to other parts of the island. And then of course, to stop the spread, um, we ask that you do not move host plants such as mamaki uh, between islands or areas and all plants should be inspected for eggs, caterpillars, and including the pupa that may be in the soil. And if you do see anything, um, you can report it to myself. My email is on the screen. Um, and if you forget that, you can always report it to the 643 pest, uh, which is the state uh, pest hotline, um, and they will forward all of that information to me and I will, I'll be able to set up a site visit with you, hopefully, um, to check your plants for eggs, um, caterpillars, um, adults, things like that. And with that, I wanted to give a big thank you uh, to DLNR, um, the Hawaii Invasive Species Council, for funding um, for this project, um, to DLNR and HDOA for the collaboration, um, and of course, to all of the mamaki growers who have been gracious enough to allow me to survey um, their plants um, and all the connections that I've made with Shaka Tea. Uh, my contact is on um, the screen um, if you have any questions, um, but you can also ask them now. And thank you so much for your time and allowing me to speak with you today. Thank you so much, Michelle. Very informative, great presentation. Um, I'd just like to open up the chat. Does anyone have questions at this time? Because it's the end. If you prefer, you can unmute yourself and ask directly. Or if you want, you can enter it in the chat. Any questions? Michelle, I am just curious, and this, mm -hmm. we may not have an answer at this time, but are there any um, control measures besides obviously observation, monitoring your plants and reporting mm -hmm. to you and DLNR, HDOA? Um, are there um, any other control measures, management? So right now we're looking at uh, biological control options. Um, I have found uh, egg parasitoid and a larval parasitoid that is present. Um, 
we're trying to identify what species it is, um, seeing if we can do any kind of augmentative biocontrol for it. Um, and that's just because mamaki is native, there's the commandment butterfly, and we don't want to be spraying um, pesticides and things like that. Great, thank you so much. Um, any other questions, comments, concerns? Has anyone seen a mamaki <laughs> caterpillar? You can raise your hand. Let's see here. Yeah, if you guys see anything, just feel free to send me a picture. Um, I can help ID um, what you see, um, eggs, caterpillars, things like that. Great, thank you. Yes, this recording will be available. So um, just to wrap things up, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Thank you very much to our, all of our presenters, Tamara, Matthew and Michelle, appreciate your knowledge and time. Um, if you are here for Landscape Industry Certified Technician CEUs, please fill out the post-webinar survey, which will be mailed shortly. And everyone that attended today, if you could please fill out the uh, demograph demographic reporting and the post-webinar survey, we'd really appreciate that. That helps us improve our programs. It's very important um, so we can continue to serve you. Um, if you have any other questions, please make sure I'll put my email in the chat as a reminder. And you can email myself or Russell Galanti, who also hosted this event today. <laughs>